Kalou. Good morning. How is everybody this morning? Good, good, good. As you're uh, making your way in, um, I got a couple announcements to make. First of all, I meant to do this last week and I forgot. If you are a first-time visitor with us, or you've been here maybe the last couple, three weeks, and you've not got one of these cards, if you will raise your hand, I'm going to have somebody get you a card. And uh, Dave, you got that? You are the man. Does anybody else need one of these cards? If you're a first-time visitor, you've been and you hadn't got one of these, uh, we just... There's just some information you can fill out, and we can uh, just have somebody from the staff reach out to you and just uh, get to know you a little better and pray for anything you may need prayer about or any concerns you may have. So, And you can just slip that back in the offering plate um, when we take up the offering here in just a little bit. So thank you for that. Um, also, parents uh, with little ones, there is a new... I think the word is kiosk, but there's a checkout thing. That's the way I say it. I don't know what a kiosk is. I thought that's a dip you get at the Mexican restaurant. I don't know. But there's a checkout thingy back there now. So if you need to check your children in, you can check them out in here or over in the student building. Um, so just remember that. And if you need help, Katie or somebody other than me can help you check them in. Um, there's plenty of people that can help you check them in. So if you need help with that, just make sure you get them checked in. And um, on Wednesday nights, we, we'll mainly use the one across the street, but we still have this one here for Sunday mornings as well. Um, yesterday, men's breakfast was really good. Bill, thank you again. And all those that cooked, we had a really good time. A lot of men sharing and praying for one another, and it was a good time. So... When we do it again, I would encourage you men to to come and 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 in, enjoy the food and the fellowship. It was really good. A lot of men spoke words that were on their heart, and uh, it was just a good time. It really was. I enjoyed it. And also, every third Sunday, I mean third Sunday, every third Wednesday, the men and women meet uh, separately. The women usually meet in here, and the men, yes, sir. Okay, so. Like I was saying, you go down there and you come back up through here. That's the fastest way to get to it. Just go down there. No, the men are actually meeting in the church office, and that is this Wednesday. And the women usually meet in here. Right, Dottie? Yes, they meet in here. So I don't know why they chose me to make announcements. but So uh, remember that. And... Um, See what else do I have on here? Prayer time is Mondays at six, and uh, you'll be doing that this Monday, Carol. Yeah, so remember that the prayer here Monday at six. Uh, we have a work day that was scheduled a couple weeks ago has been rescheduled to this Saturday. So remember that if you could come, um, some things we're going to try to do and get things ready before Easter and Easter services. So that will be this Saturday. Um, the 23rd, so remember that, and then we have a second Good Friday meeting will be tomorrow, the 18th, for all those that are involved in that, and then our young married group will be meeting tonight at 5.30 in the Student Center, so hope all you uh, young married couples can come to that. Uh, if you're a young married couple, be there at 5.30. Um, we got a lot planned. We'll have a good time. The Stuck in the Middle group are going bowling and going out to eat. That will be this Saturday as well, the 23rd at 4 o'clock. So if you have any information, you can see Kim or TG, and they will answer any questions you have about anything. Um, and then Good Friday service will be the 29th. So we're just two weeks away, two Fridays away from our Good Friday service. So remember that and be in prayer about all those things. And then two more. The women's ministry, they're going to the, uh, they're, they're planning on going on a women's retreat to see Priscilla Shire, August the 23rd and 24th. So if you're interested, <laughs> wow, let's go. 
I might go. Is that exciting? But uh, there's a sign-up sheet in the back. It's not committing to going. It's just trying to gauge interest so they can see what they need to do about hotels and all that. So if you're interested in that, please make sure you sign up for that. And then um, the 20th, starting at 10 a.m., they're going. The ladies are going to have a creative tea time, um, so that'll be April the twentieth. And if you have any questions about anything to do with the men's ministry or the women's ministry, you can see Bill for the men and Dottie for the women's. So if you have anything questions about stuck in the middle, you can see TG or Kim. And anything with young marriage, you can see Star mostly, but me and Star. Um, but I would advise you see her. She's better with details. So. Um, we went axe throwing yesterday with the young adults. That was interesting. I would tell you, church, there is hope for the future. We were, we were on our way down there. Well, on our way down there, there was hope for the future. Chris and Caleb put on some bluegrass gospel, old school southern gospel songs, and we was jamming all the way down there, and I was like, I cannot believe they even know these songs, and I was just having the time of my life. Now, on the way back, it was still Christian music, but... I didn't know what they was even singing, rapping about, but it was apparently it was still Christian. So we had a better time going. Nobody lost any fingers, so we had a really good time. And uh, the girls actually did better than the guys. So that's uh, kind of it's kind of scary to be honest with you. Start through one and hit the bullseye, and I was like, okay. So so we better behave with the ladies. Um, stand with me if you would. We're gonna go into. Uh, worship this morning. Are you excited to be here? Yeah. Um, I just got a verse I want to share with you and then we're going to pray. Psalms 19 says, the heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. It says the heavens declare his glory. Father, we just thank you this morning that you are worthy thank you that you are a good God and we just glorify you this morning Father Father we turn this entire service over to you we pray that you will have your way Lord Father we just we bless you this morning we thank you for your goodness for your mercy for your love Father and just how much you love us and how much you care for us Lord Father help us to just remove all outside noise and and the things of life that we may be struggling or going through right now, Lord, help us just to turn those over to you, Father. And we just lift you up this morning. We glorify your name. And we thank you for what you're going to do. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.
got kids in public school, you know, kids were out Monday for professional development, and um, my boss said, well, let's have some professional development of our own, and one of the things that um, our work likes to do is to get out into nature, um, to hike trails, and to see um, the goodness of the world that we live in, and um, so we went to Linville Caverns in Linville Falls on Monday, and several months ago, me and a co-worker at a retreat that we had. Um, had a long conversation about the Bible and about Jesus in heaven and hell. And he's not a believer. He's read the entire Bible. He's a very intelligent guy. He appreciates the Bible for it being good literature. He doesn't believe the things in the Bible actually happened and how could they have happened. And we had a conversation several months ago at that retreat and he looked me in the eyes and he said, so you're telling me, even though that you say you love me as a co-worker, that you're saying if I die today, I'm going to hell. And I said, I love you with everything that I have as a co-worker. I said, but yes, that's what's going to happen. If you don't believe that Jesus is the son of God, that he died and that he was raised again. So me and another coworker, we were having this conversation with him and our hearts were breaking. We were crying because we understand the severity of where he's at in his walk in life. But when we were in Limbo Caverns, if you all know, it's on the way up to Boone. Um, it's in the mountains. So we did a tour through Linville Caverns, first time I'd ever been in it. And we get to this one point, and they say it's very narrow. This is the only section that you can touch the walls in. But you go in, and it's right up against you. Um, claustrophobic people may not like it. So, And you, you get to where you're walking out on this grate. And you don't really pay attention because you can't really see your feet much because it's, you know, snug. And they flip a light on. And you look down into nothingness. They said right here is 250 feet deep that we know of, but it's got to be longer because we've dropped a rope that was 250 feet long and it never touched the bottom. It never touched anything. So we keep doing the tour and I'm like, wow, Lord, that, that's crazy. Like there's, there's this gaping hole in the bottom of this mountain that we don't know how deep it is. So as we're coming back out, they kind of make a, lo a loop in there. And she points to this circle on the ceiling. She says, I can't tell you how long water's been in here. You know, they can tell you how long it takes for the um, stagmites and staglites to form and all this stuff. But she said, I can tell you something. 
You see this circle right here? It's a sand dollar fossil, which means this whole area has been underwater, under the ocean, for long enough for a fossil to have been formed in this rock. And I said, thank you, God, because my coworker was with us. And he was amazed at how there could be a fossil from something that lives in the ocean in the bottom of a mountain, almost in Boone. He kept talking about it the whole time. Once we went to the waterfalls, he was like, that's crazy. He never stops running after us. So I just want to give you that hope that if you've got somebody in your life who you care about, Keep praying, keep pushing in, keep showing them the love of God because he's running after them just like he ran after each one of us. So God, I thank you. I thank you for your goodness. God, I thank you for your love, for not only for me and those of us who call ourselves Christians, but God, for those who have yet to call you Savior and Lord. That, God, you still see them, you still know them, you still love them. And you are doing everything that you can to show them who you are and to draw them to you. God, I thank you for your goodness. God, that you would take someone so unworthy like me and call me your child and allow me to share your goodness with those around me. God, as we approach Easter, God, that we would remember the true meaning. God, every detail that and every pain and hurt and every amount of suffering that you went through. God, that it's not the Easter eggs and the bunnies and the, the cookouts and the meals that we'll have. But God, it was your blood. It was every strap on your back. It was the very last breath that you gave so that we could know true love and redemption. God, we praise you and we thank you for who you are and for what you do. In your name I pray. Amen. If you'll join me in doing the offering declaration. So as we obey the Lord in bringing our tithes and offerings, we make the following declaration in faith. According to Malachi 3, the windows of heaven are opening over every area of my life, and my blessing will be more than I can contain. The plans of the enemy to bring destruction to any area of my life will be canceled so that I can enjoy the abundance of life that Jesus spoke about in John 10. According to Deuteronomy 28, the blessings of the Lord shall overtake me. I am blessed in the city and in the field. My children are blessed. My vocation and my investments are blessed. I am blessed going out and coming in. The Lord is commanding his blessing in all that I undertake. Every enemy that comes against me shall flee before me seven ways. This is my declaration and my commitment is to take what God blesses me with to bless others and to further the work of God's kingdom. You can bring your tithes and children will be dismissed to the foyer.
Who will never fail? 
In Luke 7, you have this picture of this lady who comes and steps into the presence of Jesus. There were so many people within the presence of Jesus, and you have this guy who's a Pharisee and he even questions Jesus. In that moment, when the lady comes and sits at his feet, if you remember, she brought oil. She cried so much because in the presence of God, there's change. That she cleaned his feet with her hair. Well, a few chapters later, you see in Luke 10 where two sisters are in the house in the presence of the Lord. One is at the feet and one is in the kitchen, staying busy. So you can be in the presence of the church house, but not be in the presence of the Lord. Let me say that again. You can be in the presence of the church house. You can pay your tithes. You can read your word. You can sit on your pew. 
You can come to church every Sunday, every Wednesday, every prayer meeting and not be in the presence of the Lord. And I believe this is where we're at as a church. I've said this time and time again, where we have become part of a religious duty and rather than getting into the presence of Jesus. And that's what this song is saying. It's just saying, I'm sorry that I came with my own agenda. I came with my own thoughts, my own things that I needed. Lord, I don't want your blessing. I want to bless you. When you get in the presence of the Lord, you realize blessing is for him, not you. And when you begin to bless him in his presence, guess what begins to happen? You begin to get blessed. Man, I receive his blessing today. Look, I just want to sit at his feet. I want to be in his presence because in his presence is where change is really found. Look, the lady in Luke 7, I, I spoke this at winter camp, but the lady in Luke 7, they had all known her, the Bible says. They knew her for her actions, what she did, who she was. And she knew who the world called her. She knew who she was in the world, but she hadn't quite realized who she was in Jesus until she got into her, his presence. And then she began to weep and God began to change her whole plans, her whole life, everything about her. Some of you just need to get in the presence of Jesus and he'll begin to change the things that you've been asking for for years. Look, it's not you that can change it, but it's him. And if you'll just come with a willing heart, with open hands and say, God, I'm going to posture my heart towards you in your presence. God, I believe you can change me in that moment. So if you're here today and you just say, hey, I need a change in my life. Can I tell you, step into his presence. Maybe some of you need to come and sit at the altar at his feet. Some of you maybe just need to bring something that you have to offer him that's expensive to you, meaning there's some depression because you like to hold on to it. That is expensive on your half. Maybe there's a relationship that is broken. That's expensive on your half. Come and bring it to Jesus and offer it to him, and he'll begin to change every situation that you have going for you. Look, in his presence is where I find joy. In his presence is where I find freedom. In his presence is where I find healing. In his presence is where I find my next in him, right? So I just feel that this morning, maybe some of you need to step into his presence this morning. And we're just going to take a moment. We're going to sing this song just for a few more minutes. Is that okay?
haven't felt the presence of the Lord in a long time. Maybe you feel like you're in a dry state. That's okay. Look, can I be honest with you? I didn't want to be here this morning. I don't feel good. I hadn't felt good in two days. I've been in bed. Pastor's not here. He had asked me to speak and I told the Lord, I was like, I need you. I need you, Holy Spirit, just to move in this place today. I have a message ready, but I want to honor him. I want to be obedient to the Lord. And if you're here today and you say, hey, I just haven't felt the presence of the Lord in my life. Can I just encourage you? Look, there's something about doing something. Faith without works is dead, the Bible tells us. What does that mean? That means there's something about being obedient. You have to step out. Because a lot of times what the enemy tries to do is he tries to keep you in your chair because that's your comfortable. That's where you're comfortable. That's where you feel more, you know, like where I got to stay in this place because I don't want to step out and I can just feel the Lord here. Maybe you're here and you just say, hey, I need the Lord's presence in my life. I haven't felt it in a while. There's some people up here that God is really moving in their life. This is an opportunity. Look, I always say, get it while the getting's good, right? <laughs> get it while the getting's good. Look, I don't want to miss the Lord. So if that's you, if you say, hey, I just haven't felt the presence of the Lord in my life in a while, could you come up to the front? There's some people here who would be willing to pray for you that you would experience Jesus on a new level. Look, our, our next is just waiting on us to be obedient. Our next is just waiting on us to be obedient. Look, maybe you've never been baptized with the Holy Spirit. Maybe you've never accepted a relationship with Jesus. Maybe you have a, 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 a place in your life that needs healing emotionally, physically. He is our healer. We still believe that. He still is our Savior. He still is our baptizer with the Holy Spirit. He is still coming again one day, and there is hope in that. So you don't have to sit back there and just say, hey, I don't know. I don't know if God can do that for me. Can I tell you, the Bible says he knows he is no respecter of person. That means he can do it for you. Say it. Say, he can do it for me. Say, he can do it for me. 
Say, he can do it for me. I believe that. I believe Judy is going to be healed. Nate, I believe you're going to be healed. I believe he is our healer in this place. And if you need healing in this place, God is moving. If you need a touch of the Lord in this place, God is moving. Don't sit back in your seat and say, he can't do it for me. He can do it for you.
come this morning and we repent, Lord, that we come with our agendas and our wants and our needs and what you can do for us. And Lord, we just say we're thankful for your son. Thankful that he died on the cross, Lord, and that was more than enough for us. For us to be in a place that we call a sanctuary. We can lift your name high. We can gather with other believers. And Lord, that your presence is tangible. It's not something that's far-fetched or something magical or something that we have to beg for, but it is tangible. It's right here with us. Not only is it with us, but us as believers, it's inside of us. God, we just ask that you would be with us today. Lord, that we would experience your presence on a new level in every day of our life. Lord, I'm so grateful for this church body. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Can we just tell the worship team thank you?
was a I was a little weak. Can we tell the worship team thank you? Aren't you grateful that we have a team that comes and takes us to the throne of God and that we can <clears throat> come in here that it's not just talent, you know. There's an anointing. And I'm so grateful for the anointing um, on this stage. Um, I won't keep you long this morning uh, with the message that I have. I have actually two messages, so I was over-prepared. So uh, uh, I'll just do one, okay? So, uh, but yeah, I I had two messages that I was working on, and I was telling you a little bit earlier that I wasn't feeling well the past two days. I wasn't able to come to the men's breakfast because I just, I just literally been in bed. I just had this sinus mess that... Uh, you know, when it hits summertime, I told Katie, I said, I never had to deal with this when I was growing up. And then the older I get, I'm like, oh, I can't even look at a tree because I feel like I'm going to get stopped up. Or Like, I always thought you were old when you carried a Kleenex with you. Look, I got like two of them over there. Yeah. I was like, oh, Jesus, I, I'm carrying a Kleenex. <clears throat> when I spoke at Shabbat, they had me a whole towel. I was like, Lord Jesus. But, um, no, I, I wanted to talk this morning about uh, life storms and uh, how we pursue it with faith. Because I believe we're in a state where um, our world, we look at our world, we look at it in a place of there's a lot of storms. And you forgive me because I am stopped up. So if I have to take a breath or sneeze or something like that, we'll get through this. Amen? Amen. Well, what you could do is you could pray for me. Actually, let's just pray right now. Lord, we just thank you. Uh, Lord, I thank you for your healing as we spoke earlier. Lord, I think that there will be uh, clarity. Lord, that there would be um, your word that would come forth, Lord, and that it wouldn't return void. Uh, Lord, I thank you for uh, sinus issues, Lord, being loose. Uh, Lord, that uh, the draining would be done. And God, that uh, we would hear from you today. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> so talking about today's life and experience, what we Uh, experience in life, uh, I think a lot of people have it mixed up when we have a relationship with Jesus, we think that life's going to get easier, and it doesn't, it doesn't, we have this misconception of, oh, when I ask Jesus into my heart and I have a relationship with him, uh, my life will be perfect, matter of fact, the Bible speaks opposite of that, it says that you will go through trials and tribulations, and that you should consider it pure joy, because that you have that relationship with Jesus, So you're going to go through trials, you're going to go through storms, you're going to go through ups and downs in your relationship with Jesus. But the thing about going through storms and ups and downs and issues with Jesus that is different from the world is that we have hope that we will get through it. Right? The world has no hope. This is their hope. They have no hope of heaven. They have no hope of what Jesus can do. They have no hope of Jesus' presence. What they have hope is that they can just make it to the next day and get through this life. And some people even believe, well, if I live good, then, yeah, the afterlife will get me to where I need to be, right? I'm glad I don't have that hope that my hope is in Jesus. Because I know when I die, when I leave this world, that I can go and spend eternity with him. Amen. And it's something that's not preached much lately. A lot of people don't preach hell. A lot of people don't preach repentance. A lot of people don't preach sanctification and holiness anymore. You know, they want to tickle the ears instead of speak the truth. And that's why you have churches that are a little bit smaller that speak in the truth. Because if we don't speak the truth in nowadays, then we're going to see a falling away like we've never seen before. Look, Pastor talked last week about speaking truth and love. Look, we have to speak truth. Okay? Now you missed that part. He talked about loving one another and, and that we love the people in the world, but we don't love the world, right? Amen. But here's what we've done. We've learned to not even speak truth, okay? We don't want to deal with that. <clears throat> we don't want to deal with the storms that are in our life. That is not my message, but that is extra. Maybe that was my third message. So Mark 4, 35 through 41, it's a, a famous story that we get in the Bible talking about the storm when the disciples was going over. And I'll, I'll read this. It says, uh, Jesus calms the storm. The day when evening came, he said to his disciples, let's go over to the other side. A furious storm came up, and the waves break, broke over the, way, uh, over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? 
He got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, Quiet, be still. Then the wind died down, and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified and asked each other, Who is this? When the wind and the waves obey him. So I wrote down a couple of things. I, I don't know over the past couple of weeks that the Lord's really just putting storms in my life. Not physical storms, but just putting that word storms in life when we're walking through life. And a lot of times when you deal with youth ministry, they go through a lot of storms before they can really hit maturity and know what it is to walk with Jesus. Not putting them down or anything, but they go through a lot of storms. And sometimes their storms might not seem significant to us, but it's significant to them. So we deal with all kinds of storms with uh, working with student ministry. And I, I wrote down several storms that I felt like we dealt with in this uh, uh, walk with Jesus a lot as believers. <clears throat> and the first one is fear and anxiety. When we see fear and anxiety, anxiety look, it makes it harder to say it when I'm, uh, stopped up. When we hear about fear and anxiety, and nowadays it is being promoted rather than being discontinued, I'll say, right? We have accepted fear and anxiety, and we use that word a lot. Well, my anxiety's flaring up, right? And I'm not taking away from anybody that really deals with issues of fear and anxiety. Matter of fact, I think Carol said that this past, uh, past week at prayer at 6 o'clock on Monday, look, you like how I promoted that. Uh, they had someone who was delivered from fear. That's why I think we ought to give the Lord a hand. Yeah. <clears throat> fear and anxiety. The storm strikes at our peace and fills our minds with worry about the future, our current circumstance. Fear and anxiety can paralyze us. And that's exactly what the enemy wants. He wants to paralyze us because if he can paralyze us, guess what? We can't do what God has really called us to do. It prevents us from living the abundant life that Jesus spoke about. But in Matthew 6, 34, Jesus tells us not to worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow or worry about itself. We worry about things that we can't control a lot of times, and that's where fear and anxiety comes from. You know that depression comes a lot of times from fear and anxiety. When I walked through depression, uh, many of you know that, I walked through depression in my... In, earlier years of being in ministry, and I had no idea what it was. I just knew I was walking through something. I couldn't sleep. I couldn't eat. I couldn't focus at work. I had no idea um, what it was. I, I would go to work, and I could just stare off in space. I'd come home, and Katie would uh, even ask me, are you going to eat tonight? And I'd be like, no. The only thing that brought me comfort in that moment was reading the Word of God. That was the moment that I read <laughs> Revelations all the way through, and I was like, Wow, if I didn't have fear and anxiety then, you know, you're reading Revelations, that's a good one. But that, that was the only thing that brought me peace and comfort in that moment of walking through that depression. And it was caused by fear, and it was caused by anxiety where I'd heard so many times in my life that Jesus was coming back. And you know how the enemy tries to play games on you where her... Are you truly saved? Are you going to really go? And that's where the enemy was. He was inside my head. And all of us have been in that moment where we say, well, I don't know. I don't want Jesus to come back. How many of you remember when you were young? I don't want Jesus to come back because I want to get married. I want to have a kid. I want to have a family. Right? We all did it. I want to die old. Lord, let, just let me have grandkids and then you can come back. Right? But that goes from generation to generation. These young people want the same things. Right? And a lot of times the enemy will use that as fear which will put you in a state of depression. And the reason it puts you in a state of depression is because you can't control what you think you can control. You can't control what's going to happen tomorrow. I couldn't control whether Jesus was coming back. I remember pastor talking about for 40 years he had heard Jesus was coming back, right? I've heard it all of my life as well. But when you have revelation of Jesus coming back and the hope that's in it, there is no fear, there is no anxiety. When Jesus comes back, you don't have to worry about anything. So I just rebuke, rebuke fear right now in the name of Jesus as anybody who deals with that says, hey, I don't know if I'm ready. Then you need to get ready today. You need to get ready today. Because we shouldn't be Christians that live in a, a state of anxiety and fear about Jesus' return. Back in the day, they would greet one another with the term Maranatha. You know what Maranatha means? 
means our Lord and Savior is coming. That's how they would greet one another. And I heard this story about this lady who was in a third world country. I couldn't tell you exactly where it's at. But she lived in a brick house, dirt floor, and she had no food really. I think she ate beans or rice uh, most of her life. She had kids and um, they would go on a mission trip to go and see her. And when they would go see her, she would greet them with Maranatha. And she was so joyful and happy to see other Christians. But that's not why she was so joyful because this was her, not her hope here. She had a future to look forward to, an eternity to look forward to, and that was hope in Jesus Christ that when she gets to heaven, she doesn't have to worry about dirt floor and bricks and what she's going to eat because heaven will take care of itself. See, we've become so spoiled that we don't have no hope in Jesus because we are a generation that can get it now and get it when we want it, right? We have cell phones. We have everything. How many of you ate breakfast this morning? or you're going to eat lunch right after church, you don't have to fear that because you know that you can go and get it in America. That's how they greet one another. Maranatha. There is hope that Jesus is coming. Right? Fear and anxiety. The the storm of doubt and unbelief. The enemy tries to put unbelief, which goes with fear and anxiety. What What happened in Genesis 4 when the serpent deceived them? There was unbelief and there was doubt. What did he say? Did God really say that? He's bringing doubt to them. Did God really say don't eat from that tree? How many of you have heard it in your life? Did God really heal you? Did God really save you? Did God really do that? Did God really say... And then what's he say? You won't surely die. It's doubt and unbelief. Doubt attacks our faith. It plants seeds seeds of unbelief about God's character, his promise, his love for us. It's a storm that can lead us to spiritual wilderness. Questioning everything we once held true. In Mark, so how does Jesus help us in Mark 9.24? It says, A father cries out to Jesus, I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. And when the father screamed out about his child who was dead, Jesus didn't rebuke him. What did he do? He healed his son. Jesus invites us to bring our doubts to him. The storm of loss loss and grief. The pain of loss of a loved one. Maybe a dream maybe any significant part of our lives that we have lost. See, a lot of times we get grief and loss from just a loved one, but that's not true. We've been learning as a staff that a lot of times loss and grief is not just that of a loved one, but it can also be something where you've moved multiple times. I remember Katie talking about uh, she was in a grieving state when they moved her back from Mexico when she was living in Mexico as a missionary. Uh, She was very upset. She was grieving that because she didn't want to leave Mexico. She loved Mexico. Uh, It was just a more simple life in Mexico, and then she had to come back here. See, grief is not just when we lose somebody, but it can be something significant in our life that we have lost. Maybe a job, maybe something that we're going through. Grief can shake the very foundation of our faith and our identity in Jesus you got to think Jesus had grief also. What did it say in John 11.35? It's the shortest verse in the Bible that everybody likes to say. Jesus wept. We say that and we don't even know what Jesus wept over. But what did he weep over? His friend Lazarus. He was grieving. He was upset of the loss. It shows that he understands our grief. But also that he is close to the brokenhearted. And he saves those who are crushed in spirit. In our grief, Jesus offers us comfort and hope and reminds us of eternal life. And he has secured, that he has secured for us. Where there is no more death, no more mourning, or no more crying. In Revelations 21.4, we see that. The storm of temptation and sin. Sin separates us from God. It leads us away from his best for our lives. Temptation promises sacrifice. Sanctification or sacrifice, but leaves us 
empty, guilty, and far from God. How does Jesus help us in that? Hebrews 4, 15 through 16 tells us that Jesus was tempted in every way, just as we are, but yet he did not sin. He understands our struggles and the things that we go through and invites us to approach the throne of grace boldly with confidence, receiving mercy and finding grace in our time of need. We have been forgiven of our sins and the strength to overcome temptation, as 1 Corinthians 10 says us. And the last storm is disappointment and discouragement. When our ex- expectations are not met in this world, our, our plans fall through or we even become discouraged and disappointed with our own life. Even when we feel like God is not in it, the storm can diminish our passion for our walk with Jesus. Jesus helps us by this. He offers us hope and not disappointment. He encourages us to cast our cares on him for he cares for us. He reminds us that he has great plans for us and they're prosperous and not to harm us but give us a hope and a future. So when we look at this story in the Bible where the disciples are on this boat and Jesus is asleep, you got to realize that Storms were normal in that day and time. It was not just a surprise to them. It would happen often. But they had seen Jesus do all of these things before, these miracles where he had healed people, where he had done amazing works in people's lives and miracles. And they had forgotten in that moment. So what do we do when we are navigating life storms in our own life? We recognize Jesus' presence in the storm. We were just talking about it this morning during worship that there is change in his presence. When we get into the presence of Jesus, he begins to mold us and teach us and change us into a place or a person that can really navigate this journey of walking with Jesus. When we acknowledge that Jesus is in the boat, in the storm with us, it changes the circumstance. Have you recognized Jesus? The second thing that we can do is trust Jesus' power, just as they did in that storm. First, they recognized his presence in the boat. The second thing, he, they trusted in his power. Why did they trust in his power? Because they woke him. They knew it was not under their own might, but it was under him. If they woke him, woke is not a good word nowadays, right? When they awoke him, we don't like the word woke. So I would encourage you to reflect on the areas of life you need to trust more in Jesus' power. Are there storms that you've been trying to weather on your own strength? The third thing that they did is they learned from the storm. Jesus used the storm as a teaching moment to increase the disciples' faith. When we go through these storms, when we look for Jesus, we can look for the opportunities in those moments. And what happens is it begins to build our faith. I can remember when I went through that depression after I came out of it, I got to look back for a moment and see where Jesus was bringing me all the way through it. I was looking back just the other day, not that I dwell on the past because we don't do that. We look forward to the mark, right? And we press towards it. But I was thinking back the other day how God has navigated my entire life for me to be where I am in this moment. And there was a lot of storms that I had to face, a lot of hardships I had to go through. I can remember when I was traveling to Tennessee, not Tennessee, but Alabama, And I had to go for my fifth week, and I was so broken because I was leaving my wife and my kid, and while I was down there, I called her, and Knox was on FaceTime, and I had my iPad set up. And while I had it set up, he, he put his arms out like this and said, I want you, Daddy, and it broke me. Like, I was like, I don't know what I'm gonna do. And I just, because when you go and you stay in a hotel when you travel for a living, 
uh, for work and you go and you stay in a hotel and then you eat at all the places, you don't have nothing else to do but go to work and come back to the hotel, there's nobody there. And then he calls me and he's like, Daddy, I just want you. And I broke down. I was like, I got to come home. That was a storm in my life that I had to navigate. And I called Katie and I was like, I'm done. I don't know what I'm going to do, but I'm done. I'm not traveling anymore. But I put my trust in Jesus and he was obedient, as he always is. I can look back at many storms that we navigated. I can look back at... Before I even accepted Jesus as my Lord and Savior, all the moments that I could have been killed or all the moments that I could have been in a place or even in jail or done things that I shouldn't have done and God brought me through it so that he could plant my feet in a place where he could use me for the kingdom of God. Look, your past doesn't determine your future, but your today will determine your tomorrow. Let me say that again. Your past doesn't determine your future, but your today will determine your tomorrow. Look, if you'll look at your today and start working on your today, God will use you in your tomorrow. I am so grateful that I looked at my today and God began to use me. And when he began to use me and I began to look at that, those moments where he would use me to do great things for his kingdom, and I trusted in him and I put my full trust in him, people would get mad and angry because they would be saying, well, he's... they." He's faking it or this and that. I mean, there was old friends that I had that I would call and they were like, man, you, you go to church now? They didn't know how to say you go, you're a Christian, right? They were like, you go to church now? You religious? How many, how many times have you heard somebody, yeah, old Paul, he's religious. And I'll be like, oh, it's a relationship, you know. But uh, I didn't want to get into it with them. But a lot of them, guess who they call first when they go through trials and tribulations? Guess who they call first when they go through the storms of life? They'll call me and say, hey, man, I just need you to pray for me. I don't know why they sound country, but they, apparently they do. Hey, man, I don't know, but I just need you to call me. <laughs> so uh, <clears throat> to this day, some of the ones that I hung out with that are still living lives that are just on a path of destruction, they will call you and say, hey, I just need you to pray for me. They'll send me a Facebook message. I just need you to pray for me. Because if God can do it for you, I believe he can do it for me. I always tell them, amen, he can. He can. And the last thing in the storm where we recognize Jesus is we recognize when we move forward, he moves forward with us. The disciples were left in all of Jesus' power. Their faith deepened. We too must move forward from our storms with a renewing faith ready to face the next challenges and and confidence that God's unwavering presence and power. Let the memory of God, of where he has brought you through the past storms, be a foundation of your faith and facing future ones. How can you apply the faith and lesson learned from past storms to challenge you to face today or tomorrow? I don't really have an altar call for us um, today. I just feel like... Um, because the Lord moved right before it and I feel like he already did what he had to do in some of our lives. But can I just encourage you today, if you're going through some storms, if you're going through some hardships, that they only last for a moment. <clears throat> they only last for a moment. If you'll just be obedient and continue to look to him, I believe God will bring you through that storm 100%. <clears throat> There's going to be some moments where you're going to have to call on him and you're going to have to wake him up. Not that he's sleeping, but he's sleeping in your life because you haven't really felt the presence of the Lord like you should. You haven't really chased the Lord like you should, right? It's important that we read, we, re we read, we pray, we spend time with him. It's simple when we talk about that, but do we truly do that in our relationship with Jesus? Do we put time apart <clears throat> to spend with him? We can say we do, but... Prayer before bed and prayer before you eat is not spending time with the Lord. There's got to be moments where you set aside and you say, Lord, this next 20 minutes, this next 30 minutes, this next hour is for you. Some of you can't hear his voice because you're not listening. <clears throat> Some of you can't get through the storm because you're not listening to the direction he's trying to give you. Look, I've walked through some tough storms. And a lot of times what I did in those storms is I caught on Jesus last. 
And he reminded me that he was here first. And if we'll stop calling on him last and we'll seek him first, seek his kingdom first and all his righteousness, that he'll answer us and everything that we need will be added. I'm so grateful that I can serve a God that never leaves me, that never forsakes me, but he's always with me. Not only does he go before me, but he follows me as we sung earlier. He surrounds me with his love. And he gives me the peace that surpasses all understanding. Could you just close your eyes for a moment? <clears throat> if you're here and you just say, hey, I'm, I'm walking through some storms in my life right now. Could you just lift your hand? I'm not going to do nothing crazy. Yeah, I see that, I see that. Yeah, I see. Wow, hands everywhere. Awesome. Awesome. Can I just let you know that that storm will pass? And that if you'll depend on him in those moments where you feel like you're being overcome by the waves and that he is faithful, that he's just sleeping. You know why Jesus was sleeping in that moment? Because he knew nothing was going to happen. He knew that he had it under control. He knew that as soon as he woke up, that there would be so so much peace. Not only did he do that, but I believe Jesus is going to rebuke some things in your life today that needs to be rebuked. In the story, he said he rebuked the storms of life. Today I say we rebuke the storms of life and that there will be perfect peace in your life. He is the Prince of Peace. So Lord, we thank you for that peace that would go forth. Lord, I thank you that in these moments where it feels overwhelming, Lord, that you're never overwhelmed, you're never surprised. Lord, that you are not shocked about the things that we go through. And Lord, that our dependency is found on, in you. And Lord, I'm so grateful for those who raised their hand in obedience and boldness. Lord, that you saw those hands and Lord, that you would begin to just, your Holy Spirit would just begin to overwhelm them with his presence. Lord, that you would comfort them, that you would guide them, that you would let them know that you love them. We thank you, Jesus, for redemption. We thank you for your word. We thank you for this congregation. We thank you for just who you are. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, thanks for being here today. Um, I apologize. I sound a little um, stopped up. But I do uh, want to share just a couple of things that Pastor had asked me to share. Uh, one... Um, Actually, Carol asked me to share this, was that prayer is moved to Mondays at 6 o'clock. So if you uh, want to come, we heard a great story of last Monday. So if you uh, need a prayer in your life, some of you raised your hand and said, about 20 of you actually raised your hand and said, hey, I, I'm going through a storm right now. There's no better team to come and partner with and have them pray with you uh, than on a Monday night at 6 o'clock. Not that Jesus can't do it on his own. He can he can do whatever he wants. There actually is a scripture in Psalms that says God is in heaven and he does what he wants. And I'm comforted in that. You know why? Because it basically says, I'm God, I'll do what I want. Right? <laughs> I, aren't you glad that you serve a God that says, hey, I'll do what I want. <laughs> Next time somebody comes against you, say, hey, watch out. God does what he wants. Right? That, that's a thug God right there. You know? Like, hey, he does what he wants. So um, the other thing is, is fellowship hall. Fundraiser. So, Pastor put out a um, a challenge. Wow, thank you, honey. A challenge uh, that we would raise the money for our fellowship hall. Um, the twenty five thousand dollars is what we're trying to raise. Not only would that uh, help us renovate the fellowship hall, but also you can tell that our carpet in here is getting a little wore out and stuff and stained. Uh, um, and Carolyn would love us because she cleans it about. Twice a week probably, uh, but she does a lot of cleaning in here and uh, we're hoping to change this carpet out too. Eventually, can you believe we've almost been in this building eight years? 
um, I think it's eight years. Yeah, it has been eight years. So we've been in this building eight years. So uh, we're wanting to do that. He gave us that challenge uh, by Easter, $25,000. We're at like $2,900 right now. Uh, so <clears throat> there's a place where you can give uh, on our, our app, our website. If you want to give to that, uh, do that. But we'll be taking an offering up. Uh, that Easter morning just for that, uh, just so we can get that renovated. Because we're wanting to do an adult prom, but we don't want to do it until the building's renovated. That's going to be our first event, so the adult prom will be fun, all right? Especially some of you adults, I'd love to see you dance, you know? So, uh, okay. Uh, uh, and then the last thing I had, oh, two things. One, uh, if you are wanting credit for your ties, you have to put an envelope, in, put it in the envelope, okay? So we have those back there and put your name on it and how much is uh, in the envelope and then you throw it in the offering plate, okay? So if you, if you just throw cash in there, we don't know who that cash is, uh, but if you want credit, because I heard some, somebody had asked me, hey, how do I get credit? Put your name on it. Even if you are putting a check or anything like that in there, still put your name on it. It helps us uh, keep everything organized. And the last thing is seniors. If you are a senior, not high school senior, sorry. If you are a senior, um, Donna would like to meet with you right after service. Donna is up here okay? Uh, she said yes. Uh, Donna's so sweet. Look at her, everybody. Embarrass her. Uh, she says yes. Uh, uh, we love Donna. Uh, but if you are a senior, uh, she would like to meet with you uh, right up here. Hey, we love you, church. Thanks for being here. And uh, remember prayer tomorrow, Wednesday at 630, and then back again Sunday at 1030. Have a great day.